they were there to make it all right, the day all right. But of course, it's a challenging job and they face a lot of challenges. And the kind of people that I've had to deal with from all walks of life, that includes people of determination and their caregivers, it is not easy. Sometimes the stories that I come across and the, the lives that I encounter, it's heartbreaking. So how do we actually create a kind of environment and kind of structures and the kind of working processes by which, you know, our law enforcers can better handle people of determination in a manner that respects their dignity, respects their rights, and most of all, keep them safe in very, very difficult circumstances. And I think that is a very important topic that uh, we're going to be talking about. And to begin, I'd like to introduce Eitan Chanov, who will explain what the Secure Communities Forum is and why law enforcement organizations are involved in this very, very critical discussion and conversation about people of determination. Over to you, Eitan. Thank you so much, Dr. Omar. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this conference has been absolutely fascinating for me to attend. And I want to thank all the organizers, including my colleague here from the ZHO, for really making this possible. Uh, my name is Eitan. I'm a firefighter and medic originally from the United States. I'm very privileged to be an advisor to the UAE's Ministry of Interior, where I work with them on developing public safety initiatives, as well as fostering international cooperation. The Minister of Interior set up the SCF, the Secure Communities Forum, initially during COVID as a virtual platform for public safety officials from all over the world to discuss how COVID was affecting us, whether it be child protection, whether it be firefighting, whether it be other topics. The SCF has since grown into a global platform that tries to engage global stakeholders from diverse backgrounds with law enforcement together to address global public safety issues. So we try to sit at the table with community organizers, with faith leaders, with academics, with NGOs, to address a wide range of under-focused law enforcement and public safety challenges. We've done a lot of work on countering extremism in gaming, including with Dr. Omar, who serves on our board, and my colleague, Lieutenant Sultan. We've done a lot of work on educating police on cryptocurrency, on working to secure elderly people from digital threats, but the crown jewel of our organization is a working group that we founded together with several organizations, including ZHO, on public safety and people of determination. We, as public safety professionals, want to serve this community, but in some places in the world, more than others, lack the knowledge and the familiarity. And so we're really excited to be here to bridge that gap with all of you, with the diverse stakeholders in this ecosystem across the room. I was very excited to see uh, Abu Dhabi Civil Defense here as well, Lieutenant Sultan from the Ministry of Interior. Only together can we really bridge these gaps. And we're really excited to host this panel with all of you here in attendance. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Eitan. And it's been an incredible pleasure working with the Secure Communities Forum and the wonderful team at SCF. You know, I can tell you this much. They raise very important questions and um, the kind of uh, for for in areas that we really need to pay attention, and sometimes these many of these areas get overlooked. And thanks to the wonderful team at SCF, we can begin the kind of important conversations and ask the right questions regarding these very key topics, such as what we'll be discussing today. And um, it's not just in asking about the questions, but it's in building capacities. And this is something that we. You know, the team at SCF has been doing for the past few events. And I hope that uh, what has been established uh, in, this, in this event will go a long way towards the kind of skills that are very needed for this very crucial issue. Now, I would like to introduce our next speaker. In fact, it's a recorded conversation from Dr. Razwana Begum. Now, she is the head of Public Safety and Security at the Singapore University of Social Sciences and she's actually one of Singapore's nominated member of Parliament Speakers and um, she's an old friend of mine and I've had the pleasure of working with her over many years. One of her key passions is in restorative justice and this is an amazing topic, you know, 
it's all about how do you find that kind of closure between someone who is a victim and someone who may have been the assailant, who could have been the perpetrator, but at the end of the day, creating a community, creating a kind of peace that can be achieved by the whole community. And it takes a community to basically heal a lot of wounds. So without further ado, can we have the uh, playback of the speech by Professor Razwana Begum. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I am truly delighted to be here today presenting at this year's World Congress on Rehabilitation. This conference brings together experts, advocates, and leaders from around the world, and I am confident that it will be a catalyst for creating greater inclusivity and ensuring the safety and well-being of people of determination. I am glad to participate in this important panel, Public Safety and People of Determination, fostering a secure society for all, alongside such esteemed speakers. As the head of the Public Safety and Security Program at the Singapore University of Social Sciences, I am deeply passionate about the work we are discussing today. I am grateful to have been invited to contribute to this critical conversation, and I want to take a moment to thank our organizers, Rehabilitation International, and the International Social Security Association, as well as our gracious host, the Zayed Khaya Organization for People of Determination. How do we define public safety? Well, public safety refers to the protection and well-being of citizens, property and communities. It involves preventing crime, responding to emergencies, maintaining order, and ensuring safe environments. Public safety services, such as law enforcement, fire protection, and emergency medical response, aim to create a secure and resilient society for all. Public safety is a collective responsibility that goes beyond crime prevention. It includes accessibility to services, emergency preparedness, and community engagement, helping build trust and ensuring the well-being of society. Next, let's look at inclusivity in public safety in the context of people of determination, or in short, PWD. PWD face increased risk during emergencies due to various challenges such as mobility issues, sensory limitations, and communication barriers. For instance, individuals with physical disabilities may have difficulty evacuating buildings or assessing safe spaces during disasters, while those with sensory impairments may not be able to hear or see emergency alerts or instructions. Additionally, communication challenges can arise for people with intellectual disabilities or speech impairments, which can hinder their ability to understand and follow safety procedures or communicate their needs effectively to first respondents. These unique challenges require specialized attention from public safety systems to ensure that PWD are adequately protected in crisis situations. It is crucial that public safety agencies, including police, fire, and emergency medical services are equipped with the skills and knowledge to interact appropriately and effectively with PWD. This is where specialized training for first respondents becomes essential. First respondents must be trained not only to recognize the diverse types of disabilities, but also to understand how these disabilities impact a person's response to emergencies. This includes learning appropriate communication skills, non-verbal communication methods, or simplified language, and developing an awareness of potential barriers that PWD may face in emergency situations. For example, respondents need to know how to assist someone with a wheelchair or guide a person with visual impairments safely 
through a hazardous environment. Implementing tailored approaches to public safety and emergency response not only enhances the immediate safety of PWD, but also builds long-term trust in public safety systems when PWD feels supported, understood and included, they are more likely to trust that the system will work for them in times of crisis. This trust is crucial as it encourages cooperation and engagement with public safety protocols, leading to more effective overall outcomes in emergency situations. In conclusion, by addressing the specific risks that PWD face and ensuring that first respondents are prepared to meet these challenges with tailored approaches, public safety systems can save lives and create a safer, more inclusive community where everyone, regardless of ability, feels protected and valued. With that, thank you, and I wish you all a fruitful conference. Thank you, Professor Rosmana, for basically providing a very strong framework for our conversation that will happen right now. Now, for our next uh, segment, let's focus on the kind of key considerations that law enforcement needs to keep in mind when interacting with people of determination. And we are very fortunate to have Daniel Migdad Alanhami, who will present on the kind of physical structures, social structures, and the kind of psychological needs of people of determination and what law enforcement needs to keep in mind with regards to this when they are carrying out their duties. So, over to you, Daniel. Thank you so much, Dr. Omar, and thank you to everyone that is still around until now, and uh, special thanks to MOI and SCF for allowing Zaid Har Organization to be part of this great initiative that is very important for public safety and justice. Now, I'm going to be building on what Dr. Rizwana has already shared in this amazing incredible video that uh, we had earlier today. And I'm going to be talking about a special term called psychological safety. Now, psychological safety is actually a term in the corporate world, usually used by leaders on how good leadership works and how you allow your teammates to speak up and be open. However, I think that this term is very important in the justice system. How can we create psychological safety amongst people of determination in public safety and the justice setting. We need them to speak up when things are needed, we need them to give their opinions, and sometimes we do need them to speak about an incident that had happened. Two main things come into play when we're talking about psychological uh, safety. One is attitudinal barriers that might exist for people of determination, persons with disabilities, and also physical barriers that may exist already. And for instance, here we're talking about things like police stations, we're talking about any authorities that have offices where people cannot come in and may face such barriers. When we're talking about attitudinal barriers, which is the subject that we will first go into, we're talking about ignorance that may seem from forces and individuals without actually needing to have that ignorance. The fear of dealing with people of determination of different disabilities. So people without the right awareness, without the right education, and without the training may have that deep fear of not knowing what to do, rather than going out there and interacting with people of determination. Something else is not having that awareness of how to communicate, the right etiquette of communicating with people of determination of different disabilities. As Dr. Rizwana said, how to guide people with visual impairments? How do you deal with someone coming on a wheelchair when they first insist coming into an office? Do I just go in and push and pull? Or how do I ask if they need help? These are all things that we take into consideration when we're talking about attitudinal barriers. It's all about people's behaviors and how we can change them to accommodate people of determination in terms of communication, to allow them to be more open about giving their opinions, and giving us details about what had happened. And how do we face those challenges? Well, number one solution is building capacity within authorities, within facilities, within a team. Could be officers, could be police officers, could be just those sitting at a, a reception counter. Once we build that kind of capacity, we're creating a positive 
human encounter. And this is the core of things. Any positive human encounter will lead to positive outcomes. The second type of barriers that may exist are physical barriers. Nobody wants to go into an office or a building and find a door that cannot accommodate them. And here we're not just talking about a ramp, we're not just talking about a high door, we're talking about information. We're talking about accessible information, accessible data, accessible entrances and accessible facilities for all different types of disabilities. And it could be as simple as having sensory, um, sensory rooms, quiet areas, which we will go in depth with Gluten and Sultan in a bit. And we'll talk about different initiatives that take those things into consideration. And then how can we portray such information in an accessible way to different disabilities that might come into the place? Creating such a universal access will also allow someone to have that open mindset that, okay, I'm coming into a place that welcomes me when they're providing me a safe environment. We're talking about public safety, we're talking about justice, but if I'm not creating a safe environment, I cannot have either of those. And guess what? Attitudinal barriers and uh, physical barriers and the lack of them goes hand in hand. I cannot fix attitudes without fixing the physical barriers. I cannot fix the physical barriers, but not fix people's attitudes. So we just have to understand that both of these go hand in hand. So while it's great to build capacity, to train people, I have to deal with people with determination, but I also have to prepare places physically and prepare data to be available and accessible to everyone. Different languages, different ways, and nowadays, assistive technology provides so many solutions that we can all benefit from. Just take a look at what happened in the past three days. We all shared information. We all brought in so many solutions from all over the world to serve specific needs and to provide accessibility in different ways. So I believe that public safety and justice cannot be safe without providing safe environments. Thank you all so much. Thank you very much, Anna. Those are very important insights that you've just provided us are a very important and integral part of that community. When we work with the community, we have to work with them as well. Sometimes we may actually need their help as well. Let's not underplay the kind of role that they can actually serve, even in the criminal justice system and keeping the whole community safe. I can tell you for a fact, there are a lot of people that have come across all walks of life, people, people of determination, who have been our best advocates for building trust within the community. And they have served us well, and thank you. And I think law enforcement officers need to learn some of the insights that you have just provided. Now, I am going to, uh, at this point, uh, turn the discussion back to Eitan Chano, who will present some very cutting edge research and findings from the Secure Community Foundation's studies on supporting people of determination. Eitan, what do you have for us? Thank you so much, Doctor, and uh, Johnny, I really uh, meaningful contact you provided on really the first step, which is making sure that people feel safe. That's what we're here as public safety professionals, whether it's my colleague, Lieutenant Sultan, who's a law enforcement officer in the Ministry of Material, here from him shortly, myself as a firefighter, a medic. We are here for one purpose, and that is safety. And if there are tools and methods that we can apply to create that safety, we are open to them. We don't have all of them, and that's what we're here to learn from you today, to learn more from all of the dominoes in the room who have these pieces of information, these insights, and their expertise that can help us perform our jobs better. So when we set up this working group, um, can we share my slides on the screen, please? Thank you so much. So when we set up this working group, it consists uh, of, of ourselves, the Ministry of Interior, police from Portugal, legislators from Singapore, academics, ZHO, and other organizations like them from around the world. We set out to create trainings, we set out to create guidelines, but we also wanted to really understand what the landscape was today. What are the impressions of law enforcement agencies and the existing skills that law enforcement agencies have to support people on determination around the world? And the first thing we did was really create a literature review 
And we found in that literature review something very, very interesting, which I'm going out of order on my slides here. Basically, what it said is that law enforcement don't know a lot about people of determination globally. They also tend to have a pretty negative relationship, to be honest. This research was primarily based on um, post-examination of case studies in the media, rather than direct engagement with public safety professionals, which we found to be a little bit of a limitation. So now if I go back to our working group, this features some of our members, we sat and said, let's not base our assumptions on other people's extrapolations based on what they read in the media. Let's actually talk to police and understand what they're really thinking and feeling. And that's exactly what we did. We conducted a really in-depth interview, around two hours long, scripted, qualitative in nature, and we interviewed 16 police officers from around the world. Really, really diverse breakup. This explored their hard knowledge of disabilities, their soft knowledge of disabilities, and also their personal experiences, both as individual law enforcement officers and what skill sets their agencies provided them with. Um, I think I can pretty much skip this slide. We, we talked about it. Um, and the literature review as well, we talked about. This is the demographics. As you can see, pretty diverse countries, East, West, developing world, uh, Europe, America, Middle East, and beyond. It's a small sample size, but in qualitative research, that's okay. And we're actually still not done. We're collecting a few more interviews, but nonetheless, this is really the first academic research that's talking to police at length in an open environment. So how do we meet them? The SEF has a very